Okay, uh, in this video I'm going to try to explain uh, how molecular orbital theory works. Okay, so molecular orbital theory is the second main theory that we're going to uh, use to explain bonding between atoms to form molecules, and that's covalent bonding. And it's uh, a little bit superior, it's better developed than uh, the other th theory that we have seen, which is called valence bond theory. Okay, so uh, let's think about the H, the molecule, which is the simplest molecule uh, that we can think of. And uh, let's suppose that the atoms A and B of the H, the molecule, or H1 and H, uh, H2, uh, are initially uh, quite separated. This would be a good representation of how the wave functions to the oneness orbital, so the uh, H sub A and H sub B atoms uh, look like. And what we're trying to figure out is, well, what happens when these atoms get close enough that the wave functions might interact with each other. Uh, what we uh, say in von Neumann theory is that, well, these wave functions may overlap, okay, and that's what forms the bond. The concept of molecular orbital theory is actually a little bit different, okay, uh, and it borrows from uh, the concept of mixing of orbitals that we have seen in hybridization. In hybridization, what we would say is that the natural atomic orbitals mix to generate hybrid uh, uh, orbitals that belong to the atom. Okay, so uh, in molecular orbital theory, what we actually say is that uh, the wave functions or the orbitals of the atoms mix to generate molecular orbitals. Now, those molecular orbitals are not going to belong to the atoms anymore. They're going to belong to the entire molecule. Okay, uh, and the way that these orbitals are actually going to mix is exactly the same way as they do in, in hybridization. It's just going to be a linear combination of the atomic orbitals. So you will uh, oftentimes uh, see the molecular orbital theory referred as the LCAOML, which is simply a linear combination of atomic orbitals to generate molecular orbitals. All right, so let's see uh, for the case of H2 how this combination of uh, atomic orbitals to give molecular orbitals would be. Okay, so uh, again, you, you have to, the first wave function that you have is uh, this. This is a uh, uh, 1s orbital for atom A and a 1s orbital for atom B. The question is, well, uh, how are these two wave functions going to mix to generate molecular orbitals? Well, if you mix two wave functions, you're going to get uh, two wave functions at the end, okay? And the uh, possible combinations, linear combinations, will be like this. This will be the first one, which is just going to be a normalization factor, which we don't uh, worry about. And then it will be uh, the first uh, wave function plus the second wave function, okay? So this is a linear combination of the atomic wave functions to generate a molecular wave function in which uh, the coefficients of the linear combination are just plus one and plus one. Okay, this will be uh, uh, the first one. Okay, and the other one, the other possibility in principle would be like this. It would be just the difference between them. Okay, so this is another combination that is going to give you a molecular orbital, but in this case, uh, the coefficients are uh, plus one and minus one. And so what we're going to see in just a minute it turns out that this uh, uh, combination of the atomic wave functions are going to give something that we call a bonding sigma molecular orbital, and this combination is going to be uh, is going to give rise to an anti-bonding sigma star molecular orbital. Okay, so let's try to demonstrate why this should be bonding and why this should be uh, anti-bonding. Okay, so let me uh, erase this. Okay, and uh, what I'm going to do is draw here what happens uh, uh, to the, uh, how this is actually drawn using this type of uh, diagram right here. Okay, so uh, when you have those atoms close, okay, what's going to happen here is that uh, now you have that the wave functions add. Okay, this would be uh, something like a constructive interference between the waves. Okay, so you can actually say that, well, the wave function is going to look something like this. Okay, when those two wave functions add, and, and we've actually uh, drawn a diagram similar to that for Van's Law theory. Okay, so this will be uh, the wave function uh, of this sigma uh, bonding orbital, but what we're really worried about is the probability distribution, okay, the psi squared. So the only thing that we actually actually do is to uh, square that psi, and uh, this graph is not going to change by a lot, it's just going to be squared. Okay, so you're going to have something like that. Okay? Again, this is just tells you about the probability distribution. Uh, what we find in this uh, sort of linear combination, this molecular orbital, is that there is quite a bit of electronic density in between the nuclei. Okay, and that is the electronic density that actually gives rise to uh, the bonding. What you have here is a ring of, the, of space where the two electrons can be uh, 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 tied or uh, interact very strongly 
to the nuclei, and that's actually what gives rise to the bond. Okay, uh, we can actually do. Uh, I'll try to write here the probability distribution mathematically. Okay, but just taking the square of that, and what you will find is that well, there's going to be here uh, normalized constant again that is not important. But what you go, you're going to find is that you have the square of the uh, wave function plus the square of the other wave function p plus two. Okay, the product of the wave function. This is actually the term that gives rise to bonding. Okay, that is the uh, term that places electronic density in between the nuclei, and that's what uh, again uh, gives rise to uh, bonding. Now the question is, well, what, what happens? How will we draw that diagram for the anti-bonding orbital? Well, uh, the way that you would do this is to say, well, uh, this is going to be where A is, and this is my wave function, okay? and this is where B is, but now in this linear combination, what we actually have is that there's a negative sign. So the wave function is going to look like this. Okay. When you put them together, what's going to happen is that, well, uh, uh, these waves that are actually here overlapping, uh, they're going to interact destructively, right? They have the, the waves have different sign, so in the end, what you're actually going to end up having is something like this, okay? Where you clearly can see that, that there is a node in between uh, the two nuclei, okay? So that would be uh, uh, psi of the anti-bonding orbital, which follows this linear combination. Of course, what we're worried about is not the wave function, but the probability, which is the psi squared, okay? So if we actually now do the square of this, what this is going to turn into is something like that. That would be B. And then you're going to have something like that and something like that. Okay, so clearly in this anti-bonding orbital, uh, there's actually a node right in the middle of the two nuclei. There's a region of space where the two electrons will never be. Okay, so clearly that is not a bonding situation. We call that an anti-bonding situation. Okay, so, so this is kind of the uh, a mathematical and graphical justification for how this linear combination of atomic orbitals to generate molecular orbitals that, that belong to the entire molecule is formed and why you have uh, bonding combinations and anti-bonding combinations. But what comes next is uh, how do we actually use this knowledge to try to draw molecular orbital diagrams, which is what we're interested in. Okay, so again, uh, after this, what we try to do is say, uh, well, how the molecular orbital diagrams that you have seen before would, be look, uh, would look like. Okay, so this is a strategy to build molecular orbital diagrams, and what I'm going to do is just uh, draw the first one for H2. The first thing that you need to do is to draw, draw here the electronic configurations of the atoms. Okay, so uh, H is just a 1 is 1, and H is just a 1 is 1. Then what you would do is uh, write a diagram in which uh, the molecule is going to be in the center, and then uh, each of the atoms that form the molecule is going to be at the sides. So this works really well for diatomic molecules when you only have two atoms. Uh, when you have more than two atoms, we'll see a couple of examples and things can get a little complicated, but uh, what we're explaining here applies to diatomic molecules. Okay, so then what you actually do is say, well, uh, this is an energy diagram, an energy grows something like this. Okay, so what you say is, well, this is my uh, 1s orbital for um, my eight atoms, and each one has one electron. Okay? And what I know from molecular orbital theory is that these two wave functions are going to mix to generate two uh, molecular orbitals. One of them is going to be bonding, the other one is going to be anti-bonding. As it turns out, the bonding configuration is actually lower in energy than the anti-bonding configuration. Okay, so from this mixing of two atomic orbitals, we get two molecular orbitals. This is what we call uh, the sigma bonding 1s, and this would be the sigma anti-bonding 1s. Okay? And the sigma bonding 1s is lower in energy than the atoms because in this orbital, if you remember the pictures that we have drawn, you have electronic density in between the atoms. Those electrons that are going to be uh, interacting very strongly with the nuclei, and that is going to result in a lowering of the energy. In the case of the antibonding orbital, the electrons are going to be far away uh, from each other and from the nucleus, that is actually going to give rise to a, a, an increase in the energy. Okay, so now that we actually know what the orbital structure is for the H2 molecule, we can, and we know what the orbitals are, we can proceed to fill those orbitals up, uh, to fill or occupy those orbitals with electrons. We actually have a total of two electrons, okay, so uh, we have here now a molecular orbital that can occupy, or that can be occupied by two electrons. This would be the molecular orbital diagram for uh, H2. 
Okay, so the electronic structure uh, uh, for H2 is this it just has two electrons, and those electrons are in a sigma 1s bonding orbital. Okay, so sometimes we actually write the electronic configuration of the molecule as simply this. You have here a sigma 1s, 2. Okay? Now, molecular real theory is a very convenient uh, 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 way to compute aspects of the bonding. Okay, uh, something that is going to be quite important uh, is, going to be a, uh, is going to be the term bond order. Okay, and the bond order is calculated by uh, computing the number of electrons in bonding ordinals over the number of electrons uh, minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals divided over 2. Okay? So for the H the molecule, what you will have is that, well, you have two electrons in bonding orbitals, you have zero electrons in antibonding orbitals, you divide this over 2, the bond order is equal to 1. Okay, so this is actually a quantitative way to compare bond strength between molecules. A bond order of 1 means that the bond is uh, weaker than a bond order of, order of 2 or of 3. As a matter of fact, this actually sets things as a fraction of bond orders. For example, I could ask you, well, tell me what the molecular orbital diagram and the bond order is for the molecule H2+, which is the same as H2, but with one electron less. Okay, so the molecular orbital diagram is going to be exactly the same. The only difference is that you're actually going to have one electron less. That would be H2+, plus. Uh, and well, this diagram might be something like this, where you just can uh, combine the, those wave functions, right? Now, the bond order for this molecule for H2+, plus, in this case, is going to be equal to uh, one electron in a bonding orbital, zero in antibonding orbital. Uh, that happens to be a bond order of 0 0.5. So what we learn from here is that the H2 plus molecule, uh, that bond is not as strong as it is in the H2 molecule, right? At the same time, we can ask, ask the question, well, what happens with the H2 minus molecule? H2 minus would be a molecule in which you have one more electron uh, than in H2. Okay, so uh, uh, the or molecular orbital diagram would look something like this, where you have H and H minus, two electrons, one electron, and then you have a total of three electrons that you need to, you need to put in the molecular orbital diagram. Okay, so uh, the story here is that, uh, well, uh, you have to put three electrons, and we know that two electrons can have the same wave function is if their uh, spins are anti-parallel. You still need uh, to place here one electron, and that electron is going to have an anti-bonding uh, sigma what is wave function. Okay, uh, this will be the molecular orbital diagram for the H2 minus molecule. All right, what is the bond order? Well, the bond order for this molecule will be the number of uh, electrons in bonding orbitals, 2, minus the number of electrons in antibonding orbitals, 1, uh, over 2. That bond order is still 0.5. Okay, so what we learn from this analysis is H2 has stronger bond than uh, either H2 plus and H2, H2 minus, minus. I'm going to wrap this up, uh, this introductory uh, video about uh, molecular orbital theory by drawing the molecular orbital diagram for the molecule H, uh, helium-2. Okay, so uh, let's try to do here helium-2, which should be uh, fairly fast. Okay, helium-2 is going to have these electronic configurations, 1 is 2 and 1 is 2. Okay, so what we actually do is exactly the same as before. We put here uh, the atoms at the sides of the diagram and the energies of those orbitals, uh, 1s, and then in the middle you will have the helium-2 uh, molecule. Okay, the occupations of these atomic orbitals are just going to be two electrons in each, and we know from molecular orbital theory that these two orbitals are going to combine to generate two molecular orbitals, one that is bonding and the other one that is anti-bonding. The bonding is lower in energy, sigma-1s, the anti-bonding uh, is higher in energy, sigma-star, 1s. Okay, so this is actually not different than what you would have uh, in the uh, H2 molecule. Now, the energies of these orbitals actually have to be the same, and I think I'm, I'm doing this wrong in your perspective, right? The energy of the 1s uh, orbital in each, in each atom has to be the same, so I think that that probably is more appropriate. All right, here we go. 
Alright, so now we just have to fill the molecular orbitals. Uh, we have four total electrons. Two of them are going to go into the lower energy bonding orbital. Two of them are going to go into the high energy uh, antibonding molecular orbital. The bond order is just going to be equal to 2 minus 2 over 2. The bond order for this molecule, according to molecular orbital theory, is zero. And what that means is that there's no covalent bond in between uh, these helium atoms. What that means is that uh, the molecule of helium-2, better written than helium squared, which is what I have done there, the molecule of helium-2 is actually not a stable molecule. There's not a covalent bond between them. There's actually, uh, there might be interatomic interactions, but those are very, very weak. This is not a covalent bond according to uh, molecular real theory, and we actually know that is true. There's no such thing as a helium-2 molecule with a covalent bond between the atoms. Okay, so that actually agrees quite well uh, with molecular real theory. Okay, so this is the first uh, uh, little uh, video about molecular theory. We'll continue to see how this applies to other diatomic molecules in the next one.